to Midsummer Scream in our feature presentation by Universal Studios Halloween Halloween Horror Nights. Each fall, thousands of hardcore fans make their way to Universal Studios Hollywood to experience one of the most incredible seasonal events in the world, Halloween Horror Nights. This event brings the biggest names and franchises in horror to life with incredible mazes and experiences each Halloween season. Please welcome to the stage two gentlemen that are the heart and soul of Halloween Horror Nights. Executive Producer and Creative Director, John Murdy. And Art Director, Chris Williams. Well, thank you very much. Welcome to Midsummer Scream. How you guys doing? We really appreciate you guys coming, and we're uh, incredibly thankful that we can hang out and chat with y'all. So let's do that. <laughs> um, obviously, we made a, a pretty big announcement this past week. Um, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? The Big Four. I, I would say returning to Halloween Horror Nights, but in, in all reality, we've, we've never had all four of these icons in one event, but we're going to have him this year, and that's Freddy Krueger! Give a mutual love here. Jason Voorhees! Leatherface Sawyer, I guess? Slash Hewitt. Um, and Michael Myers. Are you excited about this? Oh, is this not the best lineup? Uh, is this not turning out just to be the most awesome year so far? I, on Twitter I keep saying, hey, this is the best lineup we've ever had in the 11 years that Chris and I have been doing it. And they keep going, you know, oh, it's just hype, it's just hype. And I'm like, and you say that every year. I'm like, yeah, I, I kind of do say that every year. But um, sincerely, I think this is our best lineup. Obviously, we've already announced The Exorcist. <laughs> Chris and I have been chasing for 11 years to get the rights to. Um, and obviously, you know, we opened a brand new Walking Dead permanent attraction. Which will also be able to experience the Halloween Horror Nights. But today we're here to talk about the Slashers. Um, this history for us actually goes back to almost the very beginning of Halloween Horror Nights. Um, Chris and I brought back Halloween Horror Nights to Universal Studios Hollywood in uh, 2006. Um, but in 2007, we got to implement our master plan, which was to create what we call living horror movies. And to do that, we needed to license um, some famous horror properties to bring to the event and try to create them as if, you know, I always say it's like if you're in an audience and you walk through the silver screen and now you're living a horror movie. Um, so back in 2007, um, Freddy Jason and Leatherface were all owned by New Line Cinema, um, a particular gentleman named Bob Shea. Um, at New Line, who was a legend at New Line, uh, we flew out to New York and we had to convince Bob uh, to give us the rights to Freddy Jason and Leatherface. And I, I'll always remember that meeting because we're sitting across you know, the desk and he goes, you know, for years people have been coming to me and pitching me Freddy roller coasters and Jason musicals. Why should I do this? And I said, because we're the movie studio that invented the horror movie. We're going to do better than anybody else. We're going to create living horror movies that make the fans of your movies freak out. And Bob took a leap of faith with us. And uh, that was the first year we got to do uh, what we call living horror movies. And this image always reminds me of that first year. Yeah, it's about 60 masks or so. But, you know, we took the approach on these masks that um, living a, or putting you right through a live action horror film essentially um, it's all about the quality. And you know, um, you see like, this is uh, our second year coming back, and we really felt that we really needed to push the level. All this stuff is all high-end foam latex, um, and it was our second year in. So, um, we're pushing the levels even back at that time, and uh, really setting some standards. 
So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk a little bit about the history of these four properties, the history that Chris and I have with them at Halloween Horror Nights, and also tease a little bit about what you're gonna see this year. Uh, we're gonna start with the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. Previous to this year, we've done Nightmare on Elm Street three times, 2007, 2008, 2010. And I think the challenge has always been to create, you know, uh, the world of nightmares, which is the world that Freddy Krueger exists in. Um, and that includes setting the nightmare, and so the facade was always really important. Um, we did three different facades for Nightmare on Elm Street for three different years. Do you remember them? Oh my gosh. You want to this to me? <laughs> uh, the Western Hills? Yeah, Western Hills, Hills, which is the psychiatric hospital where uh, Freddie was conceived. 1428. 1428 Elm Street. And the nursery. Yeah, the nursery or the play, the play school from the remake of Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, this particular franchise, we had to use a lot of, or invent for us, a lot of uh, what we call uh, effects or gags to put you in the world of nightmares. Um, I'm gonna run through a few of them that um, we, we still do to this day, um, but a lot of them started with Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, how does this particular effect achieved, Chris? Yeah, this is a 50-50 mirror as though, you know, we're, we're showing the, uh, the effect off so you can kind of see through behind it, but essentially you come up to the mirror, he appears, everything shuts down light as well, he opens up the mirror and reaches his razor sharp gloves into your face, basically. I mean, basically that's how we set these up. And you can tell through the progression of time, we have really tried to dial these in year after year. We got better at lighting because I could see the tent of the Shrek uh, extended queue line in that particular picture. Uh, another effect we did is what we call the living statue. I think, I think this was the first this time we was did it, wasn't it? First, yes. Mm -hmm. So you're looking down a long hallway, and there were four, well, three static statues, mm -hmm. and then you had a performer. Had a performer, and then you had doors all through the side, as though it's a long hallway uh, in this institution. And there's nothing scarier than being attacked by a nun. <laughs> the statue of a nun is even scarier. Um, and this, I love this particular effect. We, we can explain how we did this. This was the stretching wall effect, which is a real key part of Nightmare. So as you walk down, um, from the statue hallway, you went into inside essentially a rubber room. And essentially, you know, you can tell that we padded out the room and then we did a build out with a four-way spandex stretch um, that you could see where a vacuform handpiece and a vacuform face mask that the performer has handles. And he's just pushing these two through as though it, it looks as though his own face is up against it. And it, we couldn't do his own face because he would get punched. <laughs> You're like, whack a hole. <laughs> so all these things have progressed. And you know, you've seen this in the early nightmare films, and they did it with latex, but we wouldn't be able to do that over time. It would, it would disintegrate. So we had to do something in respect to light spandex. And the, the type of performer that does this particular effect, we call them blackout performers, because usually they're like behind the scenes. Like a good example is last year, if you saw Crimson Peak, uh, there was there was a performer who did nothing but jiggle a doorknob, you know, from the other side. It was a Guillermo del Toro idea, um, and, and actually he was really really consistent. Yes. That doorknob was always always jiggling. Um, <laughs> but 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 the performer on the other side actually was looking at a monitor. So if you came up to that doorknob, it would stop. And that's what we had uh, told him to do, actually. So it's the, the paranormal sequence just stopped and, and that there was nothing happening. So, yeah, you know, um, we're, we're really conscious that if we put somebody on the opposite side, that they can see guest reaction. That's very important for us and them. Because a lot of times when you cast somebody and you go, okay, you're Freddy Krueger, you're playing Leatherface, you're blackout performer number 26. <laughs> They're bummed, you know, they're really, they're like, oh, wait a minute, I wanted to be. So you have to spend a lot of time and energy. And Chris and I, still to this day, we train every single performer in Halloween Horror Nights. Um, and you want to make sure they understand the importance of their role. No more will that be important, or, you know, more important than any other maze than in The Exorcist coming up. Uh, because we have a whole lot of blackout performers. In fact, there's more blackout performers in that maze than any other role in the maze. But I digress. Um, 
But we also use something called audio lighting triggers, and it's basically, it's like a guitar pedal foot switch, and the performer um, can either step on it or push it, and it triggers their own uh, lighting and audio cue, point source. Um, I think Nightmare on Elm Street was the, one of the first times we started using these in on this was. particular effect. Yeah, and here it was, actually. And there's something else going on with the glove in this one. Do you remember this? It's an LED glove. That's, you know, uh, initially, at, you know, beginning of LED technology and super bright LEDs, and this is where we were trying to actually achieve and get to of uh, glowing hand electric Freddy. So you can just shock that guy all night long. Uh, another one of my favorite effects in, uh, in our early Nightmare on Elm Street maze was the baby stroller effect. Um, so this performer actually had the ability to, to track it forward. He could push the whole baby carriage forward and then pop out of it. Mm -hmm. um, to simulate like a paranormal. He's kind of sitting like this position in here and he can track it forward that, oh, it's moving on its own. And then he pops up and out of it. We do we still have this? We do, and we put it on a rake where he would pop out. So when he came up out, he was up about eight feet in the air, really up and high. Position of performers is very important for us as well, where they're scaring. You guys know that, so it's all good. Um, and then another one we tried in uh, early Nightmare on Elm Street was what we call the body burst. We've done different variations of this, but um, when you came into the room, he had to look like he was coming out of the body on the table. I think I have a second. There we go. Um, we always the, the, the funny thing about these types of roles, and we've done them in like Walking Dead and other things, um, to get in there <laughs> is kind of precarious. We call it the rabbit hole. So they usually have to get down on their hands and knees and crawl through a tunnel in the dark, and then you know find their way into the, the, the slot where it's got um, you know the slit that they can come up and out of. I don't know that we even gave this guy a monitor back then. No, we? no, not in those days. I think we've gotten a little bit more sophisticated. He was kind of just like in the dark, crouched down, trying to figure out what his cue was. And of course, uh, the Freddy Snake. And this was like one of our first forays into creature effects. Um, and I think I have the, yeah, the, there's the sculpt and the final paint job. And this was done by? Patrick McGee in McGee Effects, yeah. And you know, as first is the Freddy Snake, and then now it's the Attack Snake. So uh, you see her getting eaten, and now it's your turn, essentially. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about our history with Friday the 13th, and then we're going to talk a little bit about Freddy vs. Jason and some of the things you can see in that maze. So just like Nightmare on Elm Street, we did Friday the 13th three times, 07, 08, and 2010. Um, and for this maze, you know, uh, pretty much Camp Crystal Lake is one of the biggest scenic challenges, and I always love this particular set. Yeah, the exterior to one of the cabins, actually, at uh, Camp Crystal Lake. And you know how we lay these things out, you can tell as though we've got a facade in the front, and then you have to enter into the cabin to uh, continue your experience. And an uh, interesting piece of trivia, uh, the trees in this particular maze were from the ETQ line. <laughs> from all those years ago, we saved them and were able to use them again. But really, Friday the 13th, um, what we're trying to deliver is all the iconic kills from the series. Um, this is one of my favorites, uh, obviously Jason with the, you know, stabbing the poor girl through the body of her lover. Yeah, and it's important for us to show all these kills, you know, in certain ways. It helps with environment, it helps also with that it's not just a repetition of a guy coming out with a machete. You know, we're, we're changing it up. And this is what also helps set us apart, actually. Um, it really does. So, um, another one. I love the car one. We, we had this, uh, this VW Volkswagen um, with a girl inside and, like, big slits cut into the roof of the car so Jason could stab his machete through the car. Um, you know, not all the time, but sometimes we get props from movies, and then we repurpose them, and oftentimes they, they find their way into Horror Nights. Um, anybody know where, where this Volkswagen is from? It's from a horror movie. It's Kate Hudson's VW from Skeleton Key. We still have this car. <laughs> I think it might be in War of the Worlds right now. I think it might be out there rotting away on the back lot. We've done so much damage to this Volkswagen over the years that we can't ever, you know, put a performer in it anymore because it's a real car, but it's just so many characters have wailed away on this thing over time. The whole roof's caved in. 
Um, but originally it was Kate Hudson's car and skeleton key, and then it became, you know, one of our props in Friday the 13th. Um, this was an early foray into mechanical effects. We called it Lickety Split. And basically the way the gag worked is when Jason came into the scene, he would hit his trigger, um, and he would be able to, the lights would go out, and then the body would split in half, and then when the lights came back on, his machete would be in the middle of the body. Yeah. This didn't last very long, as I recall. It was spray water. And it was spray water. And that's we right. get that spray. It was very ambitious, but it... But this is our first step into um, animation, basic yeah. animation and such. You know, see a lot we do is puppetry. This was a pneumatic effect, actually. I remember it being horribly disappointing, though. <laughs> yeah. you know, you, you know, by the time, you know, once it was up and running, it was like... <laughs> the poor performer's just like, I want to cut it in, you know, he's just like waiting forever for this thing. People have already left the scene, or two scenes, you know, they're still waiting for the damn thing to split. Um, and this is another, like, tried and true Horror Nights gag um, that I think this might have been the first time we did it. I know we did it in The Thing, but that was after this. Mm -hmm. uh, but we call it Spicex Kill, but you can describe how this is done. Well, you can see this is actually one of our kind of behind-the-scenes um, effect drawings, and you can see underneath the table where the performer is, you know, essentially kneeling down, and then we have faux legs coming out the back. We did, and then you see where um, our performer actually, can't really tell, but because there's an axe, he's wearing a little butt prosthetic, so it looks like he's actually cut straight down in half, that's over his rear end. But we found over time is that, hey, if we cut the front out, it's as though if he grabs the edge of the table, he could slide himself forward, so it looked really weird as though he's separating himself from his lower half, actually. I remember we did this really cool. in uh, Walking Dead, The Well Walker, you know, and you, and you always have to, you know, get a performer, and we usually get them in early, and we fit it for them, so it's custom for them, and it's padded, and I remember this one performer had this really weird look on his face, and he was in there, and he's like, um, is everything going to be cool, you know, with me in here? And I'm like, well, there's a lot of coyotes on this property, so the only thing you really got to worry about is if a coyote comes in here and tries to eat you. And then I just kind of like looked at him and then I just walked out and let him you know, think about that for a while. Um, you have to entertain yourself. Um, decapitation Kill. This is another one. This was from, I believe, the remake of Friday the 13th in 2010. Um, explain how this was done. This was a and cool one. Here's another little behind the scenes drawing where you can see the black silhouette um, where um, the victim is sitting. You can see where the performer sees out the chest, actually, um, and that's how we had it actually set up. And, and he's got a, a head magnetically, a fake head magnetically attached to the body. So the guy playing Jason had to, you know, grab the fake head, slash, rip off his fake head, and then the body would twitch and come to life, which was the performer. Um, actually, it was pretty cool. It looked really good. This was a, an actual shot of it in the show. Yeah, it turned out really well. And this was one we totally made up. There was a scene in the remake of, of Friday the 13th where you see Jason sharpening his machete. And I remember you and I were talking about that. And we're like, wow, that would be cool if you just took somebody's head and he just shoved it against the grindstone until it like wore away all the flesh and bone. And uh, so we drew it up. And yeah, so we decided to do something really messed up. We had Lucas Coltrane. <laughs> He illustrated this for us, and based on what John and I were telling him to do, like, no, knock out more teeth, and no, <laughs> rip the face up more. But then we had, we gave this to Larry Bones of Boneyard Effects, and then they, yeah, and then they went out, did a full face prosthetic, and then she's wearing a wig. And a fake eye. And, and a fake eye. The right eye. But you can see her, this performer, where her arms are down and locked, and we put two handles there, yeah. So she could control herself and get close to the stone or as far away as she wanted and feel comfortable. And Jason is not controlling her. She can control herself. But one of these girls was so good. Yeah. You remember she used to like hit her like Do we ground her face off? Chipping her teeth against the stone as it's spinning really fast. It, this was a great gag. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Freddy vs. Jason. Are you guys excited for this one? 
um, I'm actually going to share with you the imagery that I give Chris in my treatment that then he takes and uh, uses as inspiration for the, the drawing package and all the scenic elevations. So uh, we've done Friday the 13th a lot of different times. Uh, we've done Nightmare on Elm Street a lot of different times. So we wanted to come up with a different facade for this particular maze. Um, so we decided to set it in the abandoned boiler factory, the place where uh, Freddy met his demise you know, when he was human. Um, so this is just some imagery of actually uh, abandoned uh, factories and boiler factories that I gave Chris as inspiration. Yeah. Did it inspire you? <laughs> oh, absolutely. A actually, some of this inspiration was given years back, and we actually made a, a, a scenic piece based on that really rusted, circular kind of piece, actually. And we still have it. Um, you actually might see it. <laughs> uh, and there's a big prologue. We tell the story before you go into the attraction. It's being done with projection, so Freddy kind of gets to set up the whole experience, which is uh, a pretty elaborate prologue for this, um, which you'll see when you're going to the maze. Um, and of course, when we're dealing with Crystal Lake, we've done Crystal Lake a million times, and we wanted to, to kind of bring some new ideas to it. So this is visual reference of um, cabins uh, that I found, kind of ruined old cabins that I gave Chris, because Freddy's, or Jason's lair, we wanted to kind of take a different approach to it. And it's hinted at in the Freddy vs. Jason movie. There's a really brief sequence where he goes to the Crypt Camp Crystal Lake, and you just see a little hint of like bodies that seem to be kind of floating in the water. So we're going to take that a little bit further and make uh, kind of dead bodies of, of Jason's victims that are inherent to the, to the exterior of the cabin. If you want to elaborate on that. I mean, you, know, we're, you can see like really trying to get something that's really heavily dilapidated, the roof's caving in, and it's, um, and, you know, you know, these images are just so great for us to take, and then, you know, I'll do, like, some small sketches, give it to my art department, um, and then they'll turn those into, like, full elevations, and we have to try to figure out, uh, engineering-wise, how to make these roofs you know, look like they're caving in and dilapidated, so. And then our prop team, you know, in this case, because we wanted like these waterlogged bodies that would be entwined with the vines and actually part of the cabin, uh, we gave that to our prop team. And I went over and saw them with you the other day, and they remind me of Creepshow, if you know the movie Creepshow, when Ted Danson comes back. That was kind of like the inspiration we gave those guys. Um, and it just kind of gives it a different flavor. Mm -hmm. Waterlogged feeling, uh. yeah. And then, you know, inspiration comes from strange places. This particular toy kind of inspired an idea. Um, you know, it is Freddy versus Jason. So it seems like somebody should win. Um, so we wanted to do uh, something we've kind of never done before at the end. We, we have multiple endings in this particular maze. So depending on when you go through, it might be Freddy winning, it might be Jason winning. And we developed a piece of scenery that can be rotated by the performer when they come on set. So it has like even the scenery changes a little bit when uh, you come to the end. And uh, again, you know, if you if you come back multiple times to Horror Nights, you'll see a different winner and a different loser. And then of course, you know, we want to hit all the major iterations of these characters. You know, Demon Freddy, uh, Young Jason, Corpse Jason, and the Freddy Snake is going to be making a return in a new and different scene as well. And of course, you know, Wes passed away last year, so um, you could look for a specific Easter egg that Chris and I put in as a tribute to Wes, because after all these years of doing these films, multiple times, you know, oftentimes we're working directly with the filmmakers, never met Wes in all these years. Um, we never got a chance to work with him. I have no idea if he ever saw the work that we did on his properties, um, but, you know, we obviously lost a real legend in horror last year, so there'll be a tribute to Wes Craig. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Again, we did this three times, 2007, 2008, and 2012. Uh, 2007 and 2008 was the remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. A lot of people, a lot of the fans just over the years, a lot of them I've heard this is like their favorite maze of all time, or a lot of times they'll say it was the scariest maze we've ever done. Um, I think it was one of the scariest mazes we've ever done, but that's the facade of the Hewitt House yeah. from the original. Big, big southern plantation type home, um, big facade, big facade. Uh, 
I think I got in trouble for this facade, actually. <laughs> um, and then when we did the remake, uh, or sorry, when we did the original back in 2012, then we were back dealing with Toby Hooper's film, so the facade became the Sawyer House. Um, but really, Texas, you know, aside from Leatherface, of course, and the other characters, it's really about the props and dressing that make this franchise come to life. And one of my favorite scenes in all the years we've done it is the dining room. I think it's one of the best scenes Chris has ever done. Yeah, within uh, the production of the film, um, I believe they found a lot of roadkill and such. They did. They literally yeah. collected roadkill when they made that first movie. That's a low-budget film, so <laughs> totally get that. But you know, uh, what we do painstakingly, my art department and my prop people, uh, Tony Lindis and Richard Mayer, um, specifically, um, what we'll do is screenshot and analyze and really scrutinize what's really going on. And there's some really odd, really weird things within this film. Yeah, we change the angle, because a lot of times you don't get to see all this when you're going through a particular scene in Horror Nights, but I like the sausages. I love the the sausages, you know, we're really trying to capture what is really seen in the film, and like, I, you know, this big, huge picnic kind of table, I, I don't know if they found that out somewhere, but essentially yellow, <laughs> and that's what we did. You know, we scrutinize the wallpaper as well, you know, and, and we will get as close as we can of what we can find, um, and actually we can really, we can find some of the prints that are out there, actually. Um, and this really is the work of our props team and how good they are. You know, if you look closely in that scene, the lampshades are made out of human flesh and sewn together, and they had to create all this stuff. Yes. And there's another one. Yeah. And that's a great detail of wallpaper. Chris has got like catalogs and books and books and books of wallpaper, and he's always really great at like trying to match the wallpaper to a specific film. Yes. Um, another you know, great set in the, in the third time we did Texas that I loved a lot was the gas station. Um, I just remember when you came out of the house, it felt like you were outside, and we approached the gas station from the side. Um, and I just love the vibe of it. I just thought we really made oh, an environment to go into, you know. And that's what we try to do is give you guys a lot of different environments versus, you know, sticking in the Hewitt house the whole time, which would be cool. But you know, there's so much more that we can play out. And when you go into the gas station, you know, there's that scene in the movie where it's a quick shot, and you see that kind of barbecue. I guess it's called a spit uh, into the wall that's built into the brick wall. Um, and this is just another example of, of the work our, our prop department does. That's a close-up of, I don't even, what do they use for that, Chris? I have, is it real? I have no idea where they get that. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. Okay. <laughs> Mystery meat. <laughs> um, and then, you know, trying to nail all the details in this maze, we went up to the attic, and you had Grandpa, of course, who was a live character. But they also had to make Grandma, and she's not talked about a whole lot in, in, the, in the film. But, you know, we gave them this still and said, you know, hey, make grandma. This is what they came up with. I think they added their own creativity, because I don't know if that's a, a fox or a dog or a dog fox or part dog, part fox. Roadkill. <laughs> <laughs> but this, again, is the work of our, uh, you know, props and dressing crew. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the maze we're doing now, right? Woo! Woo! I love the applause, Bill. <laughs> Um, we've done Texas a lot. We've done the Hewitt House from the remake, we did the Hewitt House from the original. Um, so again, we want, you know, this is an all new maze. And so when we sat down to talk with the, you know, the, the licensors who own Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which nowadays, you know, that was an independent film. Uh, it went for years being bought and sold and owned by all these people, but it's actually owned now by Toby Hooper and uh, Kim who wrote the screenplay. Um, and we pitched them kind of an unusual idea, uh, but it's something you and I have been talking about for a really long time. Um, we wanted to make a sequel that doesn't exist to a, to a beloved horror movie. Um, if you guys know Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, you know, that movie happened many, many, many years after the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, so we decided we wanted to make a sequel to the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre that takes place five years after the original film. So when we were talking about what the facade should be, uh, we thought about the gas station. You know, in the original film, when they stopped for gas, uh, there's a sign that says that they sell barbecue. Uh, 
uh, they mention like, hey, you want some barbecue, uh, but they don't go into detail too much. When you get to Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, they've got a whole catering business. They've got these trucks that are going around. They're winning, you know, awards for their chili. Um, so we wanted to find that halfway point. And what really what was the inspiration for this is, um, that's the actual filming location. I think that's maybe 10 years ago. It's been sitting there forever in Texas. Um, somebody bought it. Do you guys know this? Yeah. Okay. Um, they are restoring it, or have restored it, back to the look of the original film. Um, and you can, you can go there, and you can eat barbecue. You can actually stay there. They've actually built all these bungalows. Um, so fans of Texas Chainsaw Massacre can go there. And this was, I was on their Facebook page, and this is the, the guy. He looks like he's a member of the family from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Well, maybe you shouldn't go there on second thought. Maybe it's a really bad idea. Uh, but this is him fixing it up. So it got us thinking and we thought, well, that, this is great. Why don't we make the facade, you know, the, the gas station? But now they've kind of converted it into a barbecue restaurant. Um, and it, like I said, it's five years after. So uh, they're having a big party. It's a homecoming party because somebody's coming home. Yes. Chop Top. Yes. Chop Top's coming back from Vietnam. Um, you know, in the film, uh, in the first film, Chop Top's not in it. It's the the hitchhiker, his brother. And you know, at the end, no spoilers, but well, at the end, he gets you know he gets killed. Um, and you know, in the second Texas Chainsaw Massacre film, uh, Bill, who plays Chop Top's running around with a corpse, which is called Nubbins, which is, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that is his brother that he carries around with him. Um, so we thought it would be fun if, if the, the beginning of the maze is a homecoming for Chop Top and he's come back from Vietnam and that's our leaping off point for this particular maze. Um, you know, you're going to go through uh, the gas station slash restaurant, uh, you're going to go through the graveyard, and we wanted to get you into the house so we thought, well, if you're grave robbing all the time um, and you need to get to the cemetery to rob graves, you'd probably build a tunnel that goes from the house to the cemetery. Um, so that's the device we're using to get you into the Sawyer's house. And when you get into the house, you conveniently arrive in Chop Top's room, um, which is an environment we've never got to do before. So again, this is visual reference that I gave Chris. And basically, I just wanted it to be as trippy as humanly possible. So it's like, you know, a, a Vietnam slash psychedelic nightmare. So um, this is some of the stuff I gave you, and our prop team is doing some crazy stuff. I, they were making a peace symbol out of human bones and all kinds of crazy, crazy stuff. And I just finished the audio for this the other night. Um, so I think it's going to be really, really bizarre. And yeah, you, even though we've done this multiple times, you can tell that we're really taking and pushing into new levels, new areas for you guys, you know, new areas to see, um, new environments to go into. Um, and that's just really important for us, you know? It really is. Now, if we're going to go to Chop Top's room, uh, there's another room we really wanted to go into. Leatherface's room. You know, in, in the film, you know, they're constantly calling him, or, or, you know, he's going off somewhere in the film. He's going into his room, presumably, but you really never get to see it in the film. So, creatively, we thought it'd be a lot of fun uh, to create what Leatherface's room looks like. We actually did this for the remake maze years ago. We actually had Leatherface's room, and we had his best friend, which was in bed with him, um, and it was, I, I called it the United Colors of Bennington Corpse, because it was stitched together from all these, like every credo and race, all stitched together, and he had a little t-shirt that said, best friend. Um, but we wanted to completely change it up this time, so uh, the inspiration I gave Chris in the treatment was like 1950s, little boy's bedroom, cowboys and Indians theme. Yeah, something really cool, really simple, 50s, and... And then I, I gave him a twist. I'm like, he has a doll collection. He collects all these dolls. So I went all over the you know, internet of all these freaky people that collect dolls. And stole their pictures and gave them to Chris. Um, but then, you know, it's Leatherface. You know, he goes around with a skinned human face, you know, a mask on his face of a skinned person. Um, so we thought, well, he would make little cute little masks for all his little dollies, you know, out of meat. <laughs> so that's why you see the, the model in the, in, the, in the lower image wearing meat over her face. Um, I thought it would be a really cool challenge for our prop people to go source all these period dolls, but then make little skinned faces that, you know, go over them. 
Yeah, they took that challenge. And they ran with it. I've seen it. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. It turned out really good, actually. And so, like, the music and everything is like this old record player, this crazy, you know, song about a broken dolly that I found from, like, the 30s or 20s or something. Um, so it just gives us as designers a chance to kind of, you know, we've done these franchises so much, and it gives us a chance to kind of lend our own creativity to the franchise. And so particularly in Chop Top's room and Leatherface's room, that's what we're going to do. And then... Um, you know, the finale, uh, I'm not going to give it away because you got to go to the maze and see it. Um, but I just love the beginning of the film with those weird, um, you hear that flashbulb sound effect, the old Polaroid camera sound effect, and there's all these weird close-ups like this one. And you just wonder, what the hell is that, you know? You'll find out. <laughs> and we'll leave it at that, I think. All right. Let's get into Halloween. So, um, unlike Nightmare on Elm Street and Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Friday the 13th, which we've done three times in the past, we've, we've only done Halloween twice. We did it in 2009, The Life and Crimes of Michael Myers, I believe was the name of that maze. Uh, and then we did it last year. Did anybody see the maze last year? Uh, that maze has the distinction um, of being the highest guest rated maze, that means you guys, because um, we do surveys every night in the park and people rate the mazes. Um, it's the highest rated maze on any coast or anywhere in the world, actually, for Halloween Horror Nights. Um, by far. Um, which is awesome. Because, you know, for, we did it back in, what, 2009, the yes. first time. And for years after that, people were like, when are you going to do Halloween again? When are you going to do Halloween again? And, and the fans, so many of you guys saw the original maze in 2009, which was really cool. But, you know, in, in the fans' mind, they built it up to be, I think, maybe better than it was, honestly. Uh, or at least it was in surveys. I liked it. I thought it was really good. I thought it was good. Um, but it wasn't the highest rated maze that year Saw was. Um, it wasn't even close uh, to the numbers. I think this Halloween maze we did last year doubled it in terms of ratings. Um, and so Chris and I, when we sat down to do the Halloween maze last year, um, we spent a lot of time talking about how do we make it scarier? Because that was kind of the knock on the original Halloween mazes. Everybody loved it, it was very faithful to the film, and it looked really cool, but it wasn't probably as scary as I think our fans wanted it to be. And that's what we wanted to set out to change. And I'll explain how we did that. Um, first of all, with Halloween, you know, if you go back, it's funny, um, how many of you guys have seen the original John Carpenter's Halloween? I think if you're... Honestly, I think if you're, you know, looking at like a typical audience for Halloween Horror Nights on any given night, I'd say less than 20% of the people, is my guess, have actually seen the film. Um, I think a lot of people, um, I know because, you know, I have like nannies that like, you know, uh, have taken care of my, my girls over the years, and I'll always, you know, before they go to Horror Nights, I'll go, oh, you gotta watch this, and I, I remember, you know, giving Halloween to my nanny last year, um, and I'm like, oh, did you watch Halloween? I'm like, that was the boringest movie, you know, they just, you know, because, and the reason a lot of people would say that these days is because they don't make movies like Halloween anymore. Go back and watch Halloween sometime. Um, the action doesn't really happen until, like, the last 15 minutes of that movie. Slow it's, burn. it's a slow burn, and it's awesome. Um, but that's the way, you know, the 70s, you know, Jaws is the same way. You don't see the shark in Jaws really until about 45 minutes into the movie. Um, and you could take the time in those movies. Nowadays, horror movies, they just never do that anymore. It's like, kill, kill, kill from the first opening frame. Um, but with Halloween, we wanted to be true to John Carpenter and that kind of setting it up, and it's called Capturing the Spirit of the Film. This is an image from the 2009 Halloween maze. Do you remember the scene? This was the, uh, yes. the laundry room, right? Laundry room, yeah. Okay. He was looking from outside. Yeah, yeah, there was the girl was inside it. Um, you see Michael in the window kind of tapping on the glass, and it was a really, really creepy scene. Um, but it wasn't like in your face, terrifyingly scary, it was just creepy. Um, when we set out to do the 2015 film, we did decide to take a few artistic licenses here, here and there along the way. Um, one of which was the room in the Myers house um, where the sister died. 
You know, you see it just through, like, his mask, yeah. through his eye holes in the beginning of the film. And then Loomis goes back there with Sheriff Brackett, and they find the dead dog. And we had a dead dog in, in that scene. Um, we had the smell of dead dog in that scene. Um, but you, you never really get a good look at that room, so we wanted to create the room that Michael Myers came back to and, and do it like a shrine. And there's a couple of funny details about this. Do you remember the candles in there? Oh, yeah. Remember how cool they looked, all melted? Yes. Do you remember how that came to be? Yes. <laughs> the temperature in that maze. Yeah, none of those candles were melted yeah. before. Yeah, those were, yeah, those were actual, like, uh, just like LED candles, which are made of an actual wax, actually, but... Um, we came in there that yeah. one day, it was like... The wax melting temperature, you know, was probably around the same temperature as uh, how, how hot it is in the mazes, because, you know, our mazes are, you know, essentially black tint in some respects, in some ways. So if you really think about August, <laughs> the weather, and... Yeah, if it's like 100 degrees out, like a day like today, where it's like, you know, maybe 100 degrees, it's 110, 115... Yeah, inside this tent. Inside that tent. Um, so the candles all melted, but it, yes. was, a, it was a lucky accident. Um, the other cool thing in here is that if you actually had time to look at the pictures, he had scratched the eyes off of every single picture of his, of his sister. It was like he didn't want her, even in photographs, looking at him, which I thought was a great detail, the prop guys. Um, but really, the goal of this maze was to make it scary as hell. Um, and this, this particular publicity still, I think, describes that just perfectly. Um, to do that, when we did the Myers House, in the original maze, we set it back in the 60s. It was all, I'm sorry, in the 70s. Sorry, no, we, 60s, 60s, 70s, 60s, 60s, 60s. All right. And it was perfectly clean and pristine, like a normal house. This time we said it in the 70s, you know, after the murders had taken place, so we could do more of the quintessential ghost house. The original working title for this maze was The Ghost of Michael Myers, and that was what we were going to subtitle this particular maze. Um, but we changed it at the last second because it just felt a little bit too, you know, like he's not really a ghost, but he, he is kind of a paranormal character because you, you see him behind the hedge, he turns around Jamie Lee, she turns back and he's gone. So um, there were a lot of moments in that maze where you would see Michael Myers in almost a paranormal way. And I've been off riffing off of that supernatural feeling of him as well. So but this is one of, uh, probably in my opinion, one of the best static images that uh, my prop guys have probably have created. Because here's young Michael here. And to me, every time I walked in, I was like, oh my gosh, he looks like he's about ready to leap down those stairs on top of you. And he turned out really great. Um, even though we changed it up, there were a couple scenes that we revisited that we did in the in the original maze. Um, so I'm just going to compare and contrast because we always try to push it and improve it and make it better. Um, do you remember the Ghost Michael in 2009? What was the problem for those performers? I had a problem with his uh, his sheet moving over his eyes and his registration that he what had a, had an issue seeing actually. So he couldn't see, his glasses would fly off his head, so even though the choking scene looked awesome, um, it, it wasn't absolutely spot on to the film. This is from last year. Um, you know, we can the dialogue, it's lip sync, the actors are miming to that. Through the course of the event, these performers did this particular gag 60,000 times, um, but the glasses never fell off. Yeah, and, and how we did that was essentially, he's wearing a bicycle helmet underneath the sheet, and the bicycle helmet has Velcro on it, the sheet has Velcro on it, so once we put that on in a certain way, then eyes are registered that he can see through within his glasses are also put through and attached to the helmet as well. So everything uh, is all there and won't move. Um, of course, we also, uh, in both mazes, did this particular scene, because you have to do it, it's one of the most classic scenes in the franchise, and it's where he finds Judith's headstone on the bed. Um, what was cool about last year's maze is we did all of that, uh, but we added in the other victims that weren't there the first time we did it, so I think I have an image. There it is. There's Bob. They're upside down in the closet. And the other character was stuffed into the cupboard. Um, but I love the fact that you could, uh, and I don't know how many people caught this, but if you were going through and you caught it at this angle in the mirror, you actually got the reflection of the tombstone that was across from you on the bed. Let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing in Halloween this year. Which 
you know, I think it was last year we were speaking at a convention. I have to give credit, you know, to we were doing like a Q&A thing, and one of, the, one of the fans asked us, why have we never done Halloween 2? So now we're doing Halloween 2. Um, obviously this maze was so successful, we didn't want to let it go. We love Michael Myers, we wanted to bring it back, but we didn't want to do, you know, the same maze we did before. Um, so we are doing the sequel uh, to the highest rated maze in Halloween Horror Nights history. What's great about Halloween 2 is it just picks up exactly where Halloween left off. It's the only sequel in the franchise that does this, and it just starts right with the night. Um, so for us, that means the facade is the Doyle House. Um, we're going to do a really cool, you know, audio lighting, some projection in this. So you get that moment when you're standing outside where you hear Loomis shooting Michael Myers in the upstairs window, um, and all of that plays out, and the dialogue he has with the neighbor, which you have to go back, I just did this maze, I did the audio the other day. It's pretty funny, the, the guy who plays the neighbor, hey, what's going on? <laughs> He's a great actor. Um, <laughs> But you're gonna you're gonna get the preamble, and then you're gonna go into the you know into the Doyle house, and we're gonna pick up the, the start of the maze is exactly where our maze ended last year. Uh, once they leave the Doyle house, we're gonna go out in the alley on the way to the hospital um, and recreate all those moments from the film, um, which also includes I love this particular scene. I shot him! I shot him six times! I shot him in the heart! He's not human! So you're going to get to see that as you're going through the alley, you know, looking through a fence, you get the little tableau of Loomis and Sheriff Brackett. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the bulk of the maze takes place at the Haddonfield Memorial Hospital, which Chris now has to build, which is being built right now. Yes. Yeah. It's turning out really good. Trying to really capture that 1970s uh, feeling in there in that hospital and with all the laminates and uh, traveling on the walls and colorations and everything. We really studied uh, this film um, uh, in its details, actually, to really pull this thing off. So you'll be walking exactly through the film and these steps that Michael took. And that means we're going to, you know, also touch on the Festival of Samhain. Um, anybody know what Samhain means? Yeah, it's, it's the ancient, you know, um, I think Druid actually, going back to those days, you know, festival of Halloween. Um, it's the, the thing that uh, you see Michael Myers painted in blood in Halloween too. So we're going we're gonna to see that as you're going through the maze, and then we're going to pay it off in a way that I'm going to keep secret at the end. Um, but we're also going to, of course, do all of the iconic kills that are famous in Halloween, too. Uh, Michael Myers gets creative in this maze. He doesn't just use a butcher knife. He uses a, a hypodermic needle. He uses a hammer. He uses a scalpel. So all of those kills that are famous in that movie, you're going to see every yes. single one of them. Yeah, so just like in Friday the 13th, like we looked at earlier some of those iconic kills. Those are really important to us, so we're plugging some of those in here as well. Um, last year, Chris and I, we wanted to come up with a kind of an original twist. Um, you know what I'm talking about, the, the mirror maze, you know, at the very end where you walk in and just Michael Myers is everywhere. Um, yeah, I love that scene. I actually performed it uh, um, Really quick, two funny things about that scene. Uh, I, one night I went to wardrobe and costume and I got dressed up as Michael Myers and I just showed up at the maze and I'm like, I'm, I'm just going to go act in the scene for a while. Um, and I figured out that if you did the scare a certain way, you could make people go in circles. <laughs> and they couldn't get out. And they, I kept seeing the same people, like, you know, six times. They're like, how do we get out of here? And then, you know, the supervisors came and they're like, you know, you're really screwing things up. And I was like, okay, I'll leave. Uh, but it was really fun because by the end, they were like crawling on the ground, <laughs> crying hysterically. Um, <laughs> And the other funny thing is, uh, my three-year-old daughter, Izzy, um, she kept wanting to see what Daddy does for a living. And I did this interview for NPR about this last year. Um, so my wife was like, we're going to bring her down. You know, maybe we can go on Despicable Me or something. I'm like, okay. And we were in between the events nights. It was in the middle of the event. And we thought it was going to rain. So all of the bodies were covered. Everything was covered. And I thought, well, it's, after all, it's just a house, you know. Uh, if all the bloody stuff's covered, then I, I think it's okay. I'll take her through, you know. And she, she went up and looked at it. I'm like, look, it's a minion. And she went, Bang! And she went right back to the street decor and the skeletons. And I was like, 
All right, come with me. I'm going to take you through Halloween. And I took her through the whole maze, and, you know, it's just a scary little spooky house, no blood, no gore. And we get to that final scene, and I forgot, oh, damn. There's like a million Michael Myers in this scene. <laughs> and she just stopped in her tracks, and she just went, who's that? <laughs> it's one of those, like, parental, you know, decisions you have to make. And I was like, that's Michael Myers, honey. And she looks at him and she goes, I love all the Michael Myers. <laughs> and, she went, and she like caught up every single one of them. And she went to the night and went, Owie, Owie, Owie. And I filmed it all, of course, because it was awesome. Um, so we had the finale last year. It was an original take. Um, Chris and I decided with this maze, we would do it again. We would come up with our own original spin that suggests that you can't kill the boogeyman. The boogeyman is everywhere. I'm not going to tell you a thing about it. Um, it is inspired by something in the Halloween movies, Halloween 2 in particular. Not technically in the movie, kind of, sort of in the movie, but you just have to wait and see what we're talking about when Halloween Horror Nights opens. All right. We have to finish up because uh, the gentlemen from Wango Point are going to be playing and, and I believe they need to load in right about now. So I'm going to do really quick, just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you to all the fans. Thank you so much. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. We're so lucky that you guys are so passionate about this event. It constantly keeps Chris and I pushing to make it better and better and better. I think when we fully announce the lineup, we still have more mazes to announce. Uh, hopefully, starting this week, coming up, um, I think you'll be thrilled. But, as a thank you, we do want to give away, we're going to give away some frontline tickets. Woo! And even though it doesn't say this on the, on the, uh, ugh, the certificate here, uh, we'll do an exclusive behind-the-scenes tour. With us, so you can also do that before the event and see the mazes unlike anybody else sees it. I'm going to do this in the form of a trivia question, okay? It's going to be related to what we just talked about. I'm going to just go with the first hand I see up. Please don't shout it out or I will rip that to shreds and nobody gets anything. And you know I've done it before, so don't, don't push me. Um, let's do a Nightmare on Elm Street trivia, okay? All right, thank you, Nightmare on Elm Street. First hand I see go up, I'm going to call on him. Please don't yell it out. In the 1984 Nightmare on Elm Street movie, when Nancy is falling asleep, um, she's watching television. What horror movie is on television that Nancy's watching? All the way in the back, you! Yeah. Evil Dead! Evil Dead is right! All right. Come on up. If you wouldn't mind being so kind. Uh, there's contact information on there. Our people will get in touch with you, and you and your guests will get to the front line tickets, and you'll get to experience Halloween Horror Nights and an exclusive behind the scenes maze tour. Give it up for it! Yeah, I just want you guys to know I tested the, uh, the people from Midsummer Screen backstage on that question. None of them got it right, so congratulations. Hey, thank you guys so much for being fans of Halloween Horror Nights. We love you. Stay for tonight's party, it's going to be awesome, and we'll see you around. Thank you very much.